The one thing I would tell you about neurovascular anatomy is uh, there's a group of people called neurointerventional radiologists who actually know this stuff. And if you're going to be a vascular surgeon that does uh, blood vessels that go to the brain as a significant part of your practice, you should spend some time with a neurointerventional guy. And, uh, and, and they're smart people. they got fabulous catheter skills. They could teach you a ton. And it's probably the one place, it's, you know, there's a lot of what we do where we do one-off stuff. You know, you do one vertebral carotid transposition in your lifetime or you do, a, you know, a renal bypass. You don't do it very often. There's a lot of stuff we do that's low frequency over a broad spectrum. And it's probably okay to do that. You probably do okay with relatively low volume. But neurovascular stuff is probably not an area that it's not a very good place for amateurs. Um, it's something to think about. In general, I don't like to, you know, be a wuss, but this is an area you probably should be a wuss. Uh, I'm just going to show you some stuff that you probably should have heard. Most common aortic arch variant of A, B, C, and D. Boing. A. Uh, which animal has a bovine arch? <laughs> which one? D. You'd think it was D, wouldn't you? Turns out a cat has a bovine arch. Yeah, it seems like it ought to be something different, but it's not. So really, the regular arch has got three branches, and that's in, you know, three-fourths of people, three-branch arch. The two-branch arch, which is rabbits, dogs, cats, and others probably, I'm sure, other animals have two-branch arches, but we call it a bovine arch. And I don't have a clue. Does anybody know why you call it a bovine arch? Cows don't have bovine arches. But you're going to use this term for the rest of your lives, and I, I don't really know exactly why. Uh, the, uh, the one branch arch is a true bovine arch, or at least that's what a cow has. Somebody wrote it in epic and they got copied over. That's probably right. That's probably exactly right. I, don't, I really have never heard a good explanation for where bovine arch came from. This, if you, if you uh, some of you have. Uh, gotten drunk. And if you get drunk and you look at this picture, it kind of looks like that. And that is supposedly why they call it a bovine arch, because the way the horns kind of come off the arch makes you think about a longhorn steer. Uh, let's see, what is it? I don't know what this is. 75%, that's normal. 15% have that. I don't know why anybody would care about the difference between A and B, honestly. So I kind of think about a quarter of people have kind of that two-branch arch, whether, you, whether the left carotid comes off a centimeter or two off the arch or whether it's just a common origin. I'm not sure it makes a hell of a lot of difference. Uh, the independent left vert, probably the next most common problem in that sort of low percentage number. And then the aberrant right subclavian is probably one out of a couple of hundred patients. And it's something in that range. It's enough that you'll see it. It's not like a rare bird, but it's uh, not very common. What is the name of the artery indicated by the number five? Can you see number five? Yeah, what is that? So that's the occipital artery. And, and once in a while, you'll cut that when you've, uh, it kind of constrains your access to the uh, distal ICA. It's probably OK to cut it, I suppose. Um, you know, it kind of depends on how likely you are to get your carotid endarterectomy to work properly. If you're planning an occlusion, then it's probably better to keep those collaterals. Uh, what is this? What is the name of this terminal branch of the external carotid artery at sort of arrow number two, that little? Thing. Okay, so IMAX, the IMAX theater, the big branch of the external that goes in. Uh, this kind of, uh, I think this is probably the simplest way. You can, you can divide the ICA into a bunch of branches, but really from a functional standpoint, it's either cervical, meaning below the bone, it's kind of running through the petrosal segment, through the petrous portion of the temporal bone, or it's kind of up behind your nose, kind of into cavernous sinus, or you're kind of up in the head, so that sort of ophthalmic segment and up. That's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, and if you look at it on the side branch, so the cervical carotid, again, basically goes to the base of the skull. 
And there's, there shouldn't be normal branches. There are some weird things, and probably the only one that I would remember is called a hypoglossal artery, and I'll show you a picture of that in a while. So you might someday run into an ICA where you had an internal carotid artery in the neck with a big branch. And you ought to have heard, sometimes that happens. It's a pretty rare bird. I don't think I've ever seen it surgically. Mike, have you ever seen a hypoglossal artery in the yeah, neck? Once, yeah, I've, I've seen arteriograms, but I've never actually operated on one with a hypoglossal artery. Uh, but basically, that's the cervical. Then the petrous portion, basically, you're running through the bone, kind of from the base of the skull until it pops up on the other side of the skull. There are some little names of stuff. The thing that goes to your uh, eardrum comes off there. Uh, but not very common, significant branches. And then the cavernous or the siphon, siphon portion, uh, there's some of these things that, the, again, the neurointerventionalists care about, meningohypophyseal arteries. Uh, the, uh, there's another one of those crazy uh, sort of vertebral variant connections called a persistent trigeminal artery that sometimes comes off there. And then you get up into, this just to kind of show you, this cavernous sinus thing is, it really is like a sponge, and the carotid artery runs right through the middle of it. Uh, there's a board question about what do you do if you uh, can't get a, you do a uh, 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 carotid endarterectomy, a thrombosis in the recovery room, you go back to the operating room, you open it up, it's thrombosed, and you get no back bleeding from the ICA. And you stick a little Fogarty up for three or four centimeters, try to get some back bleeding, and you don't get any. Uh, but the guy in the recovery room, you, you ligate the artery, and the guy in the recovery room has a big swollen eyeball, and he, you've created a carotid cavernous fistula by your manipulation in this sponge of carotid sinus, uh, or the, uh, carotid siphon in the uh, cavernous sinus. Uh, the ophthalmic portion basically is just the part where the ophthalmic artery pops off. Uh, the little dotted lines, I think you can see the dotted lines kind of up in here. This is where it becomes... You know, from here up, you're in the, you're upside the dura. So bleeding up here is a lot different than bleeding down here. Aneurysms in the carotid from here down are probably not as big a deal in terms of the risk of stroke as aneurysms from here up. That's probably relevant when you start thinking about some of the traumas and things you might get called about, about what do you do with this flap in a carotid artery up in the petrous portion. <coughs> What else? And then this sort of terminal branch, just the last little bit. Circle of Willis is probably worth looking at once in a while. If you're going to do cerebral angiography, you ought to kind of know how these arteries are connected. Uh, that's a, a, you know, one of these uh, Mayo Clinic drawings, always really nice drawings. What's that artery? There's a green arrow pointing to it. All right, A2 segment of the anterior cerebral. And what is, uh, I don't know, this is just a bunch of arteries I want to show you from the side. Ophthalmic artery, anterior cerebral, something, <laughs> callosal marginal. You know, you have the corpus callosum. I'm always saying that to the residents. Use your corpus callosum. <laughs> Let your hands communicate. If you don't have a corpus callosum, they can't communicate. The callosal marginal runs over the top of that. Pericolosal. Whatever, <laughs> something, something else, <laughs> some other branches. This is kind of interesting. You know, the way the middle cerebral comes out into the sylvian fissure, you're supposed to have this kind of a straight line of this little, these little coils as the arteries come out. And if they're deformed, you might actually have to, you might have somebody who hadn't had a CAT scan. And you're supposed to think about tumors if that, the, where the middle cerebral branches don't come out and kind of form basically a straight line. You, if you're going to be taking pictures of the brain, you're going to be stuck with responsibility for identifying stuff that you're not used to looking at. So that's a kind of an important um, something that if you're just doing a conventional cerebral angiogram after you did a carotid stent, you probably ought to be familiar with that concept. The big uh, green thing basically shows that on a typical lateral cervical angiogram, you don't see the posterior cerebral artery because it's being filled mostly from the vertebral circulation. Um, uh, just kind of familiarity again with the, the way the middle cerebral comes out and, and gives off those lenticulostriate branches, which really are where you, you know, your typical hypertensive little lacunar strokes occur off of those branches. Uh, 
standard definition, M1, the horizontal part of the, the middle cerebral, M2, the sort of vertical part, M3, next horizontal part, M4, these cortical branches that come over the surface. If the carotid, if the uh, middle cerebral branches real early, they, if it's less than 10 centimeters, you're supposed to think of it kind of being an early uh, bifurcation. This is kind of useful too, I think. It's sort of where the blood supply to the brain is. Uh, the middle cerebral is kind of that big pink area on both sides of the, the fissure. The middle part of your brain is mostly the anterior cerebral arteries. You can see it coming over the corpus callosum. And then, of course, your parieto-occipital, po mostly posterior cerebral. Um, this is a pretty common variant. What do you call it when it looks <coughs> like this? Say it again. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it's, uh, you know, basically that's fetal circulation, right? So the, the, this is a posterior cerebral. is the anterior, the middle, again, kind of straight line across the middle of those little folds. And you, again, typically you don't see this because mostly this is getting fed by the posterior circulation. Um, what's the name of this segment of the ICA? Probably cavernous. Uh, what else did I want to show you here? N nothing. <laughs> this uh, I wanted to show you. Uh, this back end of the brain, man. It, this is some dangerous stuff. Um, it, it, you know, don't put catheters up into the vertebral artery. If you're going to put a catheter in the vertebral artery, I think it's probably better to get up into the artery. Don't sit at the origin, create spasm. Use soft catheters, be gentle. Don't take big heavy things and bang them around in the vertebral arteries. They're not very happy arteries. And in and, and this part, I've never even worked up in the upper part of the uh, vertebral artery because it's, I think it really is very dangerous stuff. Um, these are these persistent connections between the carotid. Sometimes you see these on exams. The two that are probably the most common are this persistent trigeminal and the persistent hypoglossal. Uh, this is a classic picture, this so-called trident look of the persistent trigeminal artery. Uh, again, it comes up and you can see the uh, carotid comes up and then you have this early bifurcation. Instead of where the PCOM normally would be, you've got this weird branch that comes up. And We actually had one of these about, I don't know, six months ago. And you, when you see that picture, this will stand out in your mind, the trident. Uh, persistent trigeminal, you know, it's not super rare. You know, it's in that one in a few hundred patients you'll see. Uh, it's the most common probably of these anastomoses between the uh, carotid and the vertebral circulation. Mainly you need to know some things look weird and, and go get a book and figure it out that that wasn't normal. This is the other, hypo, this is the hypoglossal artery, if I can back it up. And the thing here to me is it looks like, well, here's the carotid artery. This must be the carotid bifurcation down here. This must be internal and this is external. And you go, wait a minute, how can that be external? It's going into the posterior cerebral. So this has to be something funny because the carotid bifurcation is down below this. So it's like a double carotid bifurcation. You'd say, uh-oh, that must be this hypoglossal artery that's persistent. There's a picture of it there. Uh, skip that. This, again, that picture of the posterior fetal circulation, an awful lot of these have this little infundibulum at the origin, whether it's aneurysmal or not kind of is a, a size issue. But again, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, kind of a straight line across there, and then the posterior cerebral. Let's see if there's something else I wanted to show you. Can someone answer the... About that, John, is yeah. Yeah. Right. Somebody answer the phone. Uh, that's some stuff. Uh, not important. That's probably important. The, the fraction of the verts end in pica. You don't want to high pressure inject these. It's uh, something you'll see fairly frequently. All right. Let's quit. All right. Our next.